So welcome everybody, uh, to councils and conversations. Uh, Ray Andrews, I'm the executive director of the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are the affiliate chamber of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we welcome you all for being here, uh, getting together in our virtual room here today. Uh, we'll be uh, meeting up uh, in just a moment, with Bill McLean, who's uh, been part of the Small Business Council. Uh, and this, of course, brought to you by the Technology Council. And they're all going to match up in our conversation uh, here today. So we'll just wait for a couple more uh, folks to join us, uh, come into the room, and then we'll be able to get going. Um, just give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to do. We'll have a conversation, uh, Bill and I, for about a half hour. Uh, and we welcome your comments. Lots of them, we hope, and questions in the chat room. Probably about 15, 20 minutes in, we'll start to um, address to Bill some of those questions in the chat. So uh, we'll give it about one more minute, then we'll get going. Good time for you to get your coffee, your tea, your water, uh, your schnapps, whatever you like to bring into these meetings. We'd love to have you all here. So uh, Zoom, Zoom etiquette says that if you're holding a coffee cup, you need to blow on it every now and again, regardless of what's in there. Just make, <laughs> us, th make us think that it's a hot beverage. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Good work, Tamika. <laughs> I'll share. I I bring in my uh, mug of choice is the New York City subway system. Uh -huh. I love. So I'm uh, right now. I think I'm getting off at Grand Central. So we'll get going in just a minute. It's good to see some familiar faces uh, here today too. So Bill, if you're ready, I'm ready too. And everyone who's assembled, um, uh, welcome to Councils and Conversation. Uh, if you're just joining us, I'm Ray Andrews. I'm the Executive Director of the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce, the Affiliate Chamber for the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my producer today will be Tamika Miller, um, our Vice President for Programming and Events, who put together a magnificent career fair uh, with our staff uh, uh, last week. And we thank you if you have been part of it uh, 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 last week as well. So uh, today's topic, and uh, in the next hour, we're going to explore strategic planning in 2022. Uh, we've had quite a blast of insecurity in the last couple of years, I think we'd all agree. And our, our futurist and, and the strategic planner and author, Bill McLean, who's had a, a great career and also advises a lot of manufacturing uh, companies and other businesses, um, and, and with his book, Helping Us figure out the future, uh, we'll, we'll be talking with him in just a moment. If you'd like to call attention to some of our partners, our investors who make these programs uh, entirely possible um, today. And that is of course our premier investors, some storied names that you all identify and know. Their logos are, are pictured right here. The premier investors who help bring this uh, to you today. Our key investors as well, uh, many of our uh, supporters of our chambers of commerce. Our uh, principal investors who also make things happen, not only in our community, but also here with our chamber. And there are many here that you can see on our board. And today, uh, Technology Council, of course, brought to you by Comcast Business, who make the Technology Council possible. And this is February 23rd. I don't know about you, but we have about eight inches of snow and some ice coming here on Friday. If you're dreaming about Florida or escaping from Tweed New Haven Airport, um, think about Avello Airlines. Uh, Avello has done a wonderful job uh, since they've come here and increasing their uh, amount of flights and services uh, around our area. Uh, I'll have more on that uh, coming up um, later on as well. Uh, but right now I'd like to bring in, if I can, our uh, guest who's going to talk about the future, a managing partner, strategic partner, business advisor, advisor LLC, and the author of a great book, The Four Horsemen, and some of you know him from other uh, conversations we've had within our Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce uh, family, Bill McLean. Bill, good morning, and uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Good morning, Ray, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here this morning. <clears throat> well, I think, I, uh, I think what we want to get across, and, and we certainly are going to welcome everyone to share some of their questions as we go forward in, in the chat, is this age of disruption. And you've been chronicling uh, and focusing on and writing about and talking about disruption. And 
historically, uh, we know from the Industrial Revolution, agricultural products, um, communications, um, political, geopolitical strife. We're experiencing that now with the struggle with Russia and Ukraine. There's always been disruption. Um, but at this particular time, we are in another major age of disruption. So why don't you explain what you mean by that? So when we, when we made the first book, which was <clears throat> strategic planning in the age of disruption, we were caught up in, in uh, all the arriving uh, disruptive technologies. Um, and everybody has their own list of 10, but you've got uh, uh, you know, virtual reality and robotics and automation and artificial intelligence and a, and a long, long list. And what is the impact of each of those arriving technologies uh, on society? Uh, and it's not artificial intelligence so much as it is the ripple effects of artificial intelligence. It's not the, uh, the uh, autonomous vehicle as much as it is the ripple effects, like the reduction in traffic fatalities from 40,000 a year to 40. And the ripple effects on the ripple effects. So now do we need to reassign doctors or do we need as many lawyers because we're not suing each other and so on. And at the end of each ripple effects string, you have a ethics, uh, and governance issue, that's what impacts society. So in order to understand <clears throat> what we do, how this affects the future, we need to, to, to talk about these ripple effect strings and the ethics and the governance issues that are raised uh, by them, who retrains the workers, for example, uh, what happens to the communities when a business moves out and so on. And when you realize the magnitude of the changes, then it becomes very apparent that the way we used to do strategic planning uh, for the last 50 years uh, is not only totally inadequate, but is even a threat to our being able to uh, do well in the year 2030. So first of all, let me say that future as we're looking at it is not tomorrow and it's not a year from tomorrow. It's 2030, it's eight to 10 years out. Uh, that allows us to get the perspective of being able to break the chains of extrapolation planning, which we have been using for all these years. What I mean is this, I used to be, I would go into a CEO and he would uh, ask me, it was always a he, and he would ask me uh, for, to help them with a strategic plan. And if I could tell that CEO uh, if I could show him a plan or a path to get to a 10% or 15% increase over what inflation was expected to be, he would be grinning ear to ear. That's what he wanted, right? They want extrapolation planning. And if you look at the, when you look at the tools that, that strategic planning has always used, and there's three main tools, the biggest one, the oldest one is SWOT analysis joined recently by pestle analysis. But SWOT analysis, which I'm sure you all know, is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The strengths and weaknesses is backward looking. It says, what am I good at? What have I done for the last 40 years? So then incrementally, I'm gonna extrapolate on that. In this age where entire industries are being created uh, or eliminated, seemingly overnight, that sort of approach is nothing but trouble. I'm gonna throw in a, a quote here, offer a quote from a friend of mine. Uh, and she said, uh, the pace of change today, the pace of change today is the slowest it will be for the rest of your life. The pace of change today is the slowest it will be for the rest of your life. I don't know about you, but that scares me, right? because I think it's going pretty fast now and, and we're running as fast as we can to keep up with it. And if this is the slowest it's going to be, how do we, how do we approach 2030? <clears throat> so what we've, what we've done is we started looking at the disruptive technologies. That was what that first book was about. Uh, and in fact, we applied that to a couple of uh, clients 
And the, uh, the, the second client that we used that with, a manufacturing company with about 200 people in it, and we had just rolled it out, and, it, and the vision for 2030 was a, was a lights out facility. If you can imagine what that means. Lights out facility, <clears throat> everybody remote. And this was a manufacturing plant. Um, and we were patting each other on the back and celebrating. We had a little party and so on. And that was in December of 2019. And three months later, COVID hit. And what happened to COVID, the effect that COVID had on me personally, and as I look around and talk with other people who like to look at the future, I think it was pretty universal. Everybody suddenly is talking about this week or next week or the payroll on Friday. At most, it's a month or two out. If you can remember April and May uh, of 2020, but I was absolutely, after decades of, of looking eight and 10 years out, was absolutely unable to see 2030. Mm. Could not see it. Could not see it. So uh, the, the, the fellow um, futurists, I'm not even sure I like the word futurist, but those that like to look ahead and strategically plan and so on. And, and, and I've got several that I talk to on a fairly regular basis. <clears throat> and we were trying to understand what just happened. Uh, what just happened? Because we were so fixed, fixed on the disruptive technologies. Uh, of course, COVID came out of nowhere. Uh, didn't expect that. Didn't plan for that. And the more we talked about it, the more we saw it is not just COVID. And it's not just the disruptive technologies. There are actually, we call them the four horsemen. There are four major disruptors on the stage right now. <clears throat> because there's also the toxic politics. Wow, toxic politics, unbelievable. And, and it just keeps on going with, uh, with Ukraine, as you just mentioned. Uh, and, and also the social unrest, also the social unrest. Uh, and so there really are four, and some people would make a, a case that there's actually five when you throw in um, the climate change uh, with the forest fires and, and those sorts of change, changes that we are seeing. <clears throat> So once we understand these, and, and that's, that's what we've been trying to do is to understand each of these four, the first book gets into that quite a bit. Uh, and once we understand them, it's easier to see 2030. Suddenly back again, we could see what things might look like in 2030. So the first book uh, introduces a, a, a quick concept here um, and, and, and that is the shiny objects and ripple effects, which I just want to spend a minute on. The disruptive technologies and really even COVID uh, or driverless car, you know, all these new things that we love to talk about, like clickbait, um, really don't impact society. It's the ripple effects and then it's the ethics and governance issues, as we mentioned before. So. So we've introduced in the second book uh, a, a process of envisioning that, of envisioning 2030. And it's, it's really a two-step, uh, it's a three-step process. The first process, um, well, before I get into that, let me, let me tell you a quick story uh, uh, about the, um, the, the drawbacks of, of traditional strategic planning, which we're beginning to realize. Uh, we had the, um, uh, the, the tools, which are SWOT and voice of the customer and competitive analysis and so on. And I went to work for a company in, uh, in the area, a manufacturing company in the area uh, back in the mid uh, 90s uh, to help them with, a, uh, uh, with their marketing. And they had hired a consultant firm uh, out of Manhattan to do a strategic plan for them. And when I was there, they delivered the strategic plan uh, it was 200 pages long. It cost them $65,000, if I remember correctly. And when I came back and I left the company shortly thereafter, and I came back as a consultant in uh, 2016 to help them with strategic planning. Uh, and uh, as, as I looked at the bookshelf, there was this 200 page report uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, 20 years before and I, I spend a little bit of time leafing through it and very little of what was in that strategic plan had been implemented. And that's the drawback of traditional strategic planning. 
which is generally uh, incremental uh, uh, and, and based on the future, built, uh, excuse me, based on the past. Um, and so that, that gives an illustration of the drawbacks to traditional. First of all, it's viewed as an event and it should be viewed as a mindset. Every person in the, uh, in the C-suite and everybody who is fully engaged with the company needs to have a strategic planning mindset to, to, to view the data points, to see the new data points and the trends and so on and to feed them back so that the, the strategic plan, which is evergreen, can be modified and so on. It's not done uh, as an event. And the second thing is, it's not, should not be done by outsiders. It needs to be done with a planning team from inside uh, a, uh, a diverse planning. I hate to see these planning teams that are made up of the C-suite. You need the younger people there because believe me, they look at the world very differently than, than the boomers and, and the people with, uh, with gray hair. So it needs to be done with insiders, probably facilitated by uh, someone who is trained in, in, in facilitating and in strategic planning, uh, but they're the ones who are gonna be implementing it. And, it, and it, the plan needs to be developed by the people who are intimate with the application and who are going to be uh, implementing it. The third drawback to traditional strategic planning is it's often, the, the deliverable is often a report. The deliverable in strategic planning needs to be a successful implementation, not a report that's gonna sit on the shelf. And the fourth drawback to traditional strategic planning and the hardest one to overcome because it keeps poking its nose back in there is that it's rear view mirror based. So <clears throat> with that in mind, we introduced uh, the, the concept of envisioning uh, the future. And the way that we do that is we have a three-step process. The first step being to uh, select a team, a planning team. Maybe it's six people, maybe it's 10 people. It's got to be diverse. It's got to be demographically diverse. Um, you're going to have to make some allowances. If the CEO wants to sit in on there, what effect is that going to have on the comments coming from the other people? So there's a you know a little bit of uh, housekeeping that you got to do to make that team workable. And the second step is you have to have a wake up exercise. I have a friend who works at a manufacturing company and he just celebrated the 41, 41st anniversary of his working there. I wonder, nice guy, I wonder how many of the things he does on a daily basis or the way he thinks is the same way that he did them 41 years ago. So the first thing we have to do is we have to take this planning team and we have to wake them up. And the way that we do that is on the first, the first day uh, when we meet with all of them, we distribute a list of futurists, newsletters, blogs, websites, and so on. And we ask everybody on the planning team to please pick three, four, or five of these and to follow them every time the newsletter comes out, which is usually weekly sort of thing. And then every meeting we had for the next six months, the first uh, 15 or 20 minutes of that meeting was go around the room and share with us something gee whiz that you discovered from these futurists. And what that does, and that's fun. You, you'll see them, uh, I've seen them tittering, uh, laughing with enjoyment. Uh, with the new things that they've come up with. So what that tends to do, hopefully, what that tends to do is to open them up, wake them up. And then we continue that for as long as we're, as long as we're meeting with the team, we continue that because everything's new, every day there's new stuff, and we have to continue to grow and continue to open our eyes. So, okay, we've selected the team, we've implemented the, the wake up exercise, and the most important exercise, the third big step is, is we use an exercise called envision the, and then you fill in the blank. You fill it in with an industry. Uh, uh, so for example, 
envision the future, meaning 2030, envision the future of healthcare. So what do you think healthcare means in the year 2030? And you've got to do this in a team. You can't think through this one. It just comes from so many different directions. And you talk about uh, the technologies, the wearables, the implantables. You talk about how the drivers in healthcare, which traditionally have always been the providers, the insurance companies and the pharmaceuticals, have always been that way. And now you find the pharmaceuticals uh, losing some of their power because they're getting more visibility and, and so on. You find the insurance companies uh, losing some of their power. And if we ever go to a uh, Medicaid for all, they're going to lose a lot of their power. Uh, and you find a new player, uh, the voice of the patient uh, now sitting at the table. So that whole dynamic is changing and will continue to change. And this is what you're going to talk about in your planning team when you discuss the future of healthcare for the next uh, three, three meetings, five meetings, whatever you think it takes. And when you're finished with that, what do you have? What do you have? You have a vision of 2030 for healthcare that comes at it from several different angles. And you have an understanding of the ripple effects and of the moral and ethical and governance choices that need to be made. And when you feel that it's ready, then we're just going to take that future of healthcare and we're going to set it aside. And then we're going to do five or six or, or eight more the future of. And some of the areas uh, that are a lot of fun to do is the future of work because everybody's very engaged in that. What's that mean? And it goes far beyond whether I work from home, uh, work remotely, or I go into the office. Uh, it also involves what tools do I use? Uh, and how do I relate and what new skill sets do managers need when they can't see their people uh, and, and who comes in not at nine o'clock, but late and leaves early and so on. And that's the way that a lot of managers manage these days or in, in the past have managed by seeing who is physically there rather than by uh, some metrics of performance. So we need to ups, ups, uh, upskill the managers uh, there's a lot of different things uh, that need to be talked about in the future of work. How about some of the other subjects? How about the future of mobility or the future of cities? How about the future of, how about the future of money? Can anybody explain to me what NFTs are all about? Hmm? Can anybody explain blockchain to me? Well, that's what it's going to be. They're going to print the last dollar bill in America, they're gonna print that somewhere around the year 2040. We're headed for a cashless society. And what does that mean? And how do I teach Noah, my grandson? This is why I'm doing all this, this is Noah. And he's 18 months old when this picture is taken and somehow it's my responsibility or partially my responsibility to help prepare him for the world. How do I teach him about money? Not the way I learned about money. I learned about money by shoveling walks and, and getting 75 cents, three quarters in my hand and feeling it. You can't feel it. You can't feel it. So what we're, what we're doing here by doing the future of is we're, we've got the future of healthcare. We've got the future of work. We've got the future of money. And, and hopefully we've got uh, uh, five or six or eight others. And all of a sudden, a couple of things have happened. Our mindset has changed from being an extrapolative rearview mirror sort of mindset of how do I build on the strengths I've got to this view of the future where the question to me now is, how do I get there? How do I get there? And I know that I need to implement some technologies, whether, <clears throat> whether you've got a, <clears throat> excuse me, a service company or you've got a manufacturer, whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Technology is gonna be a big, or is now a big part, is gonna be a huge part of it. And how do I get there? And so you're gonna think, well, gee, I really need to be getting into artificial intelligence, or I really need to be getting into virtual reality or augmented reality or whatever uh, for training or, or whatever. And you're, when you think about the question of how do I get there, what are you really doing? You're building 
you're building a strategic plan. So uh, one, uh, one, one final word uh, about this, uh, and that is that this vision and the way that the, the various companies and the governments hopefully <clears throat> uh, it is not monolithic. It's not a, it's not a, a, a binary, uh, uh, we're, we're all there, we're not all there or whatever. Uh, it's going to arrive in waves. So rural companies uh, out in you know, the Midwest or something are going to do it at different speeds and value different uh, applications uh, rather than Eastern uh, urban areas. Um, other countries are going to be uh, applying this and understanding it in, differently than, than other countries, right? Developed countries are certainly going to uh, develop it at different speeds than developing country, country, uh, countries. Uh, so what this means, what we have to do is we have to kind of understand some of the parameters that everything is changing, that we need to keep forward focused and so on. And so that's, that's why we wrote the two books. They're both on Amazon, uh, Envision the Future, meaning 2030, and then Plan Backward. Because we need to teach Noah and we need to prepare our companies for 2030. Ray, that's about, uh, that's about my, my list of ideas here. Um, well, I have a funny uh, thing. Uh, you have a lot more uh, ideas too, and you know, a couple of questions. We're gonna welcome your questions. They're starting to populate in the chat room here. Um, I, I will get to your question in just a moment. I just have a couple I wanna ask you, uh, Bill, because um, we're flesh and blood uh, and, and we are not AI uh, as people. Um, we're not robotic, we have emotions, we have navigation, uh, we have traditions, uh, cultural and, and personal traditions that we sort of all adhered to. So the disruptive nature sometimes, and you mentioned the political um, pushback on that, is with the disruption comes anxiety. So how do we deal as a strategic planner with the anxiety to, to be empathetic leaders to help our, our staff and help our companies navigate these changes? So I have a couple of uh, answers uh, to that, Ray. Uh, one of them is uh, there are consultants who are very, very good at helping a company to cope with change, uh, whether it's cultural change or, or whatever. The second thing is that uh, to, to my way of thinking, we have been approaching change uh, all wrong for a long time. Maybe it's uh, in the uh, human nature. Uh, change seems to trigger the fight or flight response. Uh, and yet, and yet, if you look back hundreds of years, we've always been in change. We've always been in change. So uh, what we need to do is to talk about it more. One of the things that people are afraid of with change, for example, automation is going to wipe out the jobs. And that was the fear uh, back in the uh, early 1800s with the first industrial revolution. Uh, and and it, in fact, it made more jobs. It's just that the jobs are different. So for example, we don't need as many secretaries anymore. We don't use as many uh, uh, bank tellers anymore. But if you look back to 2007, which was, which was not that long ago, right? There was not a single app developer in the world. Not a single one. Do you know how many there are now? There are literally millions of app developers. So things change. Some things uh, uh, go away. Um, I can envision the time when Noah's going to ask me, uh, Granddad, what's a, what's a secretary? Um, but we always seem to do better as long as we don't let the fear lead what we're doing. And there are, there are exercises and there are ways of counseling. One of the big things I think we need to, that, that I, we've been talking about lately has been to upskill managers, the way managers uh, treat 
subordinates or team members. And they have to be, managers need to be so much more supportive these days and empathetic. Empathy is a huge word. Uh, and the more that we are able to make uh, workers or friends or family comfortable talking about it, the more that the more that the change is not going to scare us. So it's a it, that's a huge topic. That's a specialty. Uh, I'm not a specialist in that. I I agree that uh, change has that fight or flight response. And I and I hope that you're satisfied with that answer. <laughs> well, you covered a lot of ground, but but it's it's interesting you mentioned empathy and skilling up on that. Um, certainly during um, the COVID period, in the last couple of years, we know that's had to be the case because we are separated. So our traditional environments have been taken away from us. And for some, that may have increased productivity. For others, it might not. Um, but it, it isn't quite 1984. We don't have work cams in the kitchen or in the in the home office. Um, Whereas if we gather in shared common space and congregate, um, traditionally you could navigate and find out who's in their office, who's not in their office, who came into work today, who's late to lunch. Now we have sort of an autonomy. How are we gonna be able to deal with the autonomy and the separateness that technology allows? Separateness is a good word. And, and initially we're going to be feeling very um, uh, estranged uh, or uh, out in the wilderness uh, and alone. Uh, and that's been a common feeling. Um, that's going to evolve. Uh, there are more and more people who prefer to be by themselves or who prefer to start their own company because having sat on uh, around the house for two years, they realize they don't like that commute or they don't like the pressure of the office uh, and they'll go out and they'll start their own company, and that company will be different from the company that it left. There was one estimate that there will be 10 million new small businesses started between now and 2030. 10 million, mostly started by people who have not been trained in, uh, in, in business, um, have observed it or, or whatever, but not trained, which opens up a whole new industry of consultants to train those who have just started their their, their new company or to, to you know, to help advise them. No. So I, we have some wonderful questions that are coming in here in the chat and uh, uh, Deborah and Isaiah are, are asking essentially the same thing, which is how do we stay in touch with what you're discussing aside from the four horsemen reading your book, but also um, in, in terms of futurist blogs, and I know you expressed a little discomfort with the word futurist, but how can we understand these changes? Are there sites that we could engage we can follow are there um is there a guru on a mountain uh so there are um uh there are these gurus uh for, for example in the healthcare field there's a there's a doctor in hungary by the name of um uh name escapes me how about uh, ray if i supply you with a with a list uh, of of eight or ten and anybody who would like to kind of plug in, uh, and and in the uh, so I will uh, that's my action item, Ray. And uh, uh, in the meantime, anybody who wants to uh, wants to plug in and start reading some of this stuff, there's a futurist by the name of Thomas Frey, F R E Y. You can Google him. He's got a a, a, a newsletter. It's more than weekly. Uh, he's terribly prolific. Uh, and he covers uh, everything from from healthcare to the future of cities and, and so on. Uh, there are several magazines that that have uh, regular uh, uh, regular columns on this sort of thing, and all all virtual, of course. And I, and and so Ray, I'll give you that list. But uh, but that's the best way that I've found to stay plugged in. Uh, and if you find someone who likes to talk about this sort of uh, of some people don't like to talk about it, uh, but if you find someone who does like to talk about it, then make it a habit. Uh, you know, at a certain time, I talk with Prague every uh, Wednesday morning at ten o'clock, and uh, which is the end of the day for him. And uh, uh, and 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 I've got another group uh, down in Westport. We used to meet for lunch, uh, and that's the, tomorrow. Uh, last time we talked about the future of democracy, and that was interesting. And if you have thinkers with you uh, in the group, 
you'll 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 walk. I've never walked out of one of those discussions without saying, "Wow, I never thought about it like that," or "Wow, that's a different direction." So it's it's very stimulating, and and it and it helps this wake up that we have to continually make ourselves do. I want to ask another question from Melanie. Uh, she's rec asking uh, you, uh, recommending a uh, forming strategic plan team for the business and pulling in one person for each critical business unit. Or do you suggest having each critical business unit do their own planning and then bring that to the team? So there's already a starting point. So do you advance one or do you hold back, have the team prepare it and then bring in those, those changes? Right, right. Um, I've seen it done both ways. Uh, usually when you have one person from each business unit, you're talking about a larger company. Um, so the, the way that I've seen work best is when corporate defines the corporate goals or the corporate vision, uh, which is loose and not very exact, and then let each of the business units assemble their own team. So they can work with the vision but they've got a particular application, maybe a particular industry or whatever. And, and they need to be, the people on the planning team need to be intimate with the application. Interesting, great, great answer. Um, Xavier asked, when envisioning the future of, with a team of people who are not used to thinking this way, what is the number one pitfall they should avoid and how? Well, what we do with the, with the wake up is kind of, is kind of fun because all of a sudden they never thought about these things. It's kind of fun. And then they go back to their day job and do things the way they've always done them. Um, but the wake up is, is, is first. And, and then when you get into the future of, and you get into these discussions and comments, the biggest thing that people will say, the biggest challenge, Xavier, good question, is, is people want to respond. They're, we've all been trained to respond, right? So, you know, I've had, managers uh, say to me, I had a, 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 an operations manager who ran all of production say to me, Bill, that's not the way we do things here. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and at that point, it's management. This one is gonna live or die by how much commitment you have with the CEO, from the CEO, not from the vice president in charge of something, from the CEO. And the CEO, when somebody says, uh, that's not the way we do it here, the CEO says, that's the way we're gonna do it in the future. Or the CEO says, I don't ever wanna hear those words out of your mouth again. So it's, it's not something that we can nicely tiptoe around and allow different points of view. There's one point of view, and that is we're gonna look at the future and then we're gonna figure out how to get there. Because if you, if you, if, if you don't do that, you end up with extrapolative planning again, and everybody has their silos. So you have to break that down and get to the vision. The law of unintended consequences, uh, that a change creates the ripple effect that you're discussing uh, here, is, is I'm thinking about um, a, a map of the world um, pre and post World War I or pre and post World War II with geopolitical dynamics. And certainly we're experiencing that right now this week in terms of the past versus the future. Um, how do we get out of the thought that there is in a nostalgic sense, a better way of doing things from the past where historical notion could help us in our strategic planning today? And what I mean by that is the pushback. If you go to New Jersey, you're not pumping your own gas. 49 other states you can self-serve and you have a lower price for gas. So on some level, there's protection going on. Somebody wants to protect their embedded past. How do we get a strategic planner to not live in that lane of, of, of nostalgia or protection? Right, uh, two, two thoughts. I'm not sure I have the perfect answer for this one, Ray. It's a great question. Um, but um, uh, one is, I don't mean, and if I, if I gave this impression, I apologize. I don't mean that we don't uh, celebrate history, learn from history, uh, and, and what we learn, we can then apply. There were many things that happened in the first industrial revolution in 1820 that are happening exactly again, right? If we don't learn from that, then we're gonna struggle with it this time. So I, I'm, I'm, not, 
I'm not denigrating history. I think it's extremely important. Um, to the second part of your question, uh, people feel uh, are in their comfort zone. They 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 keep mm, not migrating back, but but backsliding. We used to we used to call it uh, into that. And and there's where the CEO and the facilitator need to say, George is backsliding. We've had a Dutch uncle, uncle talk with him. Uh, we've encouraged him to this or that, but that's the way his DNA is made. So some people have to leave the planning team. Uh, this is this is not a you know cut your finger and exchange blood. Well, you know we're always going to be blood brothers together. No, this is the future, and sometimes you have to say that person is not appropriate for it. They may be very good in what they're doing, but they're not appropriate for the planning team. And and rotate some new people on and, and rotate uh, some of those people off. So one thing I'm, I'm really thinking about is, is a, a conversation we had, councils uh, conversations here at the chamber with healthcare um, and, and telehealth. We did a webinar on this, I think about uh, four or five months ago and telehealth has exploded during the pandemic. And initially you would think, how could I not see a physician, a doctor or attending medical expert in person to talk about my body? And yet there's a dynamic change right there with new technologies that's made it a lot more efficient in terms of scheduling, in terms of diagnosis, uh, and also using that new technology. Um, telehealth in a way during COVID has kind of saved us. So may I comment? Yes. I work with the uh, Cornell Scott Hill Health Center. Um, I remember having a conversation with the uh, chief medical officer in January of 2020. And uh, since, since I've, I've got some sort of vision of healthcare in the future, I said, why aren't we doing telehealth? And he said, Bill, very simple. We don't get compensated for it. The state and the insurance companies give us 10% of what a face-to-face -face visit is. 10% doesn't pay. So then we had, I, I had a, 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 another conversation with uh, the same doctor uh, end of March, uh, after on a weekend, over a weekend, Cornell Scott transitioned to telehealth. Over a weekend. We have had the technology for a million years, and it took this to make us get into telehealth. So now telehealth visits uh, during the pandemic were making up three quarters of all doctor visits. Three quarters. Imagine that ripple effect of that was, guess what happened to no-shows? No-shows had been around 25%. They dropped to less than 5%. So you, you've got ripple effects on that one too, right? Yeah. Well, in a way, it creates greater efficiency. I mean, go from 25 to 5%, you're blocking out time that otherwise would be allocated yes. to patients who just don't show up for whatever reason. Yeah. So I have to ask you a question about, and we certainly want your questions, folks, in the chat. Uh, if you can put your questions in uh, for Bill, um, Bill McLean would be very happy to answer your questions. Uh, but I'm thinking about what we're ready for and what we're not ready for in terms of new technologies. Um, in a reveal, my, my brother-in-law is a pilot for American Airlines. Uh, and he says, you know what we're ready, what technologically we're ready to do right now? Not fly an airplane with crew. Mm -hmm. or fly an airplane with crew. We actually can do that. The technology is in place, much like a drone, to, to get up in a jet. Let's not have the Bellow Airlines uh, um, create a special for Florida weekend right now with one of these ideas, but uh, you can actually, within a year or two, fairly safely test a commercial airline to fly without a pilot and crew from one destination to the other. Would you not agree that most people are just not ready for that? That some technology may exist, but we just can't implement it because the fear factor is too high. You know, you you a, a great a great point, and and it's been made with the uh, autonomous vehicles as well. Um, uh, but the pilots are not landing the jets, and they're not taking the jets off. The computer is. Yeah. So they sit up there. I'm not sure what they do up there. But computers are landing and taking off those jets today. We just don't talk about it. Yeah. I'm not sure I know what my brother-in-law does either, but um, that's another matter. 
uh, another conversation, but it's, it's fascinating when you think about the technology in place. So we could uh, uh, take a few more questions. If we, if we don't want to do that, Tamika, we could go into um, an eight minute gathering uh, for more intimate conversation about some of the technology that um, you've been seeing, uh, planning within your own business, using some of the uh, visioning. And then Bill, we can, after the uh, breakout rooms end, and Tamika will organize those breakout rooms, we can come back and convene again for some final thoughts from you. Um, but it'd be really great. Um, so everybody stick around. You'll be going into these into these old chat rooms or we'll have an opportunity to um, engage each other. Yeah. And then click yes. And uh, Tamika, you can take it away and then we'll come back again. Okay, so hold on just a few seconds. You know, Bill, I, I'm thinking also uh, convening just like our councils and conversation when I came to the chamber pre COVID, we would assemble in conference rooms at 900 Chapel Street or in a other location around the greater New Haven area. And now with a couple of clicks, this is how we are assembling. So we're going to join the chat rooms, join, and then we'll all come back. Thanks, Bill. We'll have our final uh, thoughts with Bill after we come back in about eight minutes. Did you get lost? Uh, I just joined at the very last minute, so I am trying to get through. Uh, okay, so I can put you in a room. Um, okay. Let me see if I can put you in a room. Your name is Michael Rada. Yeah, if there is a room where Bill is speaking or where Bill is attending at the moment. Okay, so I'll can... move you to room one. All right. Okay, so let me see. Thanks a lot. You, room one. Thank you.
Welcome back. We're just waiting for the others to come back. To make, I think we did it. I think we have everybody who's uh, circulating back and we'll be joined by Bill uh, in just a moment. Who I thought was, uh, as they say, on game. And had a all lot right. Of so um, we wanna thank you all for coming. I wanna just uh, spend about 60 more seconds with you, uh, Bill McLean um, and the Four Horsemen. And uh, thank you very much for, I think, a terrific overview of all the technological changes and all the strategic planning um, uh, changes coming up. So uh, with just 60 to 90 seconds left, putting you a little bit on the spot with a time frame, um, our vision for the future um, in, in terms of everything we've, we've talked about today, um, I guess change is constant. Ch change is constant. I think it's gonna be better in the future. Sometimes people will try to characterize the future as either utopian or dystopian, and I don't believe it's going to be that. And I'm very anxious to see 2030 in reality. Great. Thanks. Your grandson, too. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be wonderful to see his future. Well, thank you all. I just want to mention before we wrap up, and I want to thank you, Bill McLean, uh, for a really great presentation here for Councils and Conversations. And again, thanks to Comcast. Uh, sponsoring our technology council. Don't forget Avello Air uh, and all the flights to Florida this time of the year. Uh, go to the Avello uh, website and learn a little bit more. I want to tell you about a couple of events that we have coming up here at the chamber. Uh, tomorrow we have Join Day and it's uh, calling all BIPOC businesses in our region. We have a very strong diversity, equity, and inclusion effort with our chamber as we are committed in both chambers, including the Quinnipiac Chamber, to serve the entire business community. So tomorrow at 11 o'clock, you can join in uh, the chamber right here. Everybody is invited. I'll be there. Hope you will be too. Join day. Learn more about this chamber of commerce and how we serve the entire business community. And uh, also, uh, for those of you who would like to drop 25 like I did last year doing this, uh, you'll just love walking. Starting up March 1st, next Tuesday, we're going to start onboarding and registering um, folks from all the chambers around the state to participate the Blue Back Health's uh, Chamber Wellness Challenge. We're all placing up, we're taking steps, we're walking. Uh, it's a three month wellness challenge. Um, you can incorporate that into your routine, win some prizes at the end of this after three months. Um, you can register starting up in March. The program will start on April 1st. Uh, and again, it was a wonderful thing for so many of us to do uh, last year. So again, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it's 9.30, we wanna be respectful of the time. So uh, thank you again, Garrett Sheehan, uh, our president and CEO says hello to all of you. Tamika Miller, thanks for uh, doing the controls uh, and producing everything. Thanks, have a great day, everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thank you.